Let's begin with chapter 11, Intermolecular Forces and the Physical Properties of Liquids and Solids. Um, oftentimes, intermolecular forces, the term might be abbreviated IMF in writing. Um, and these are, we're also going to relate these things to physical properties. And you'll recall from Chem 1 uh, the difference between a physical and a chemical property, that a physical property would... Um, would measure how something changes, but chemical properties are, are dealing with chemical changes. Um, phys in a physical property, the, the identity of the substance stays, stays the same. And so uh, common examples are like when things boil or when they melt and, and the temperatures at which that happens. Um, I encourage you to read chapter 11. All I really want you to read are the first two sections, 11.1 and 11.2. There's a lot in chapter 11 we will not cover. But I encourage you to read the introduction there and the first two sections. This um, chapter is different. It's going to require you to be able to think critically. There's not going to be calculations. You're going to have to look at things. You need to know how to draw Lewis structures and interpret things about that Lewis structure like polar, nonpolar, is it an ionic compound, etc.? Because you have to know that in order to interpret the intermolecular forces and then to, um, to talk about and to discuss the properties that that liquid might have. It, the chapter opens with a, I mean, a, I think a lot of these chapters open with something interesting that's more, it's relating the chemistry of that chapter to practical things, to to life situations and the picture at the front of your chapter it's talk it there's a cute little baby and it talks about in china in 2007 these babies infants were being hospitalized with kidney stones and i i, I think y'all it was like it was over it was 58,000 infants i believe ended up being hospitalized and um six died but the, the problem was traced back to the formula that these babies were getting because they were formula-fed babies. I mean, it wasn't, um, what else could it be? It was something they were ingesting. But when formula or any food has to meet certain tests, you know, we have our FDA here in the United States um, that approves food. Well, the, form, the baby formula in China, I don't know what test they used, but they would test the formula to be sure that it had enough nitrogen in it because the nitrogen should be coming from the protein in the formula. Proteins have that nitrogen, uh, I guess backbone is what you'd call it. I'm, I'm a little uh, far removed from my biochemistry, but you got that amine group on all your, your amino acids that make proteins. Um, and so they would test for nitrogen. And if the baby formula met the required amount of nitrogen, it was assumed that the nitrogen was there because it was in the correct form of a protein. Well, what this company did is they doped it. They added stuff to the formula that was high in nitrogen so that the formula would pass the nitrogen inspection, okay? And the problem with what they added, they added something called melamine, and I looked up a picture earlier. And it's not posting my picture that I looked up. But there's a picture in your book on page 483. Um, and it shows a melamine complex. Um, but the melamine they doped it with, it had something else in it that the the company that was doing this illegal stuff didn't know. Uh, it had a, I think it was cyanuric, cyanuric acid. Well, what happened is the melamine and the cyanuric acid, they, um, they bonded together, not a, chem, not a chemical bond, but they connected together so that they were insoluble. They wouldn't dissolve. And they formed these kidney stones in these babies. Now, it might have been okay if the melamine hadn't been contaminated with the cyanuric acid. Um, well, I say okay in that maybe they wouldn't have got caught. Okay, that doesn't make it okay. 
but it um, when these babies drank the formula, uh, it wouldn't dissolve. And so it had kidney stones. The babies had kidney failure. Um, you know, and of the over 50,000 that were hospitalized, I don't know. I didn't dig into it. I don't know if there were long-term problems with it or not. But um, that was 2007, 2008. And there were some, um, there were criminal proceedings for some of the people that worked for that company that allowed that to happen. But China took care of that. So um, when we talk about intermolecular forces, these are the forces between the molecules, okay? So what we're not talking about in this chapter is intramolecular. Okay, the intramolecular forces are the bonds. Okay, like your covalent bonds and your ionic bonds. So when you're talking about intramolecular forces and disrupting those, uh, that's going to be a chemical change. Right, because you're talking about like taking a water molecule, H2O, right? And that would be the Lewis structure for H2O. And we are talking about an intramolecular breaking these bonds, right, and forming a new compound. But in intermolecular forces, we're talking about, and I'll just stick with water as an example, the force that makes this water molecule attracted to this water molecule. And, you know, if those water molecules aren't attracted to one another, you have um, water vapor, right? And if there's an attraction between those water molecules and a whole bunch of them, you would have liquid water. And if the attraction is even stronger, you would have solid water or ice. So there's different strengths in intermolecular forces, and we're going to talk a lot about how those are related to making things be you know, a gas or a liquid or a solid, and the boiling points of things and the freezing points, etc. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about um, intermolecular forces uh, between pure substances, so like just pure H2O. As we get a little later, we'll talk about, um, you know, like when you have sugar in water, when you have two different substances, a mixture, what what causes sugar and water to mix, but yet cornstarch and water do not, okay? So that's coming later. But first, let's talk about pure substances. Collectively, these intermolecular forces in pure substances are known as van der Waals forces, okay? And there's um, three main types we're going to talk about. London dispersion forces. Oftentimes that is just uh, discussed as dispersion forces. It doesn't always include the word London in front of in front of it. Uh, so London dispersion forces. Dipole dipole interaction, or it might be relayed as a dipole dipole attraction. And hydrogen bonding. Okay, and that one's kind of a little bit misleading because it does have the word bonding in it, but it is not a bond like a covalent bond or an ionic bond, okay? It, the bonding word is used because hydrogen bonding is a really strong force, uh, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. And I've written these in order of their strengths in that London dispersion forces are very weak forces, and as I just talked hydrogen bonding forces are the strongest of these three van der Waals forces. Um, molecules can have, you don't just have to have one type of force in a molecule. Um, as we'll see in a minute, every molecule has dispersion forces, okay? Uh, hydrogen bonding is a little bit more exclusive. Oftentimes, if something has hydrogen bonding, it will also have dipole-dipole. Okay, but there can be any kind of combinations of these, but every molecule has dispersion forces. So let's, um, let's first, what are dispersion forces? Let's talk about that one first. The weakest force um, 
these are intermolecular forces between nonpolar molecules, mainly. I'll put that parentheses between mainly nonpolar molecules, okay? Again, all molecules have intermolecular forces, but when you're just examining intermolecular forces, if the molecule's nonpolar, um, then dispersion force is the only force you have to worry about. Um, an example of a nonpolar molecule, if y'all will remember in uh, Chem 1, and drawing a Lewis structure. Do you remember the formula for methane from Chem 1? Okay, methane CH4. And if you know that's the formula, then I would expect that within a, a few seconds in your head, you know exactly what the Lewis structure for methane looks like. Okay, and I would expect every one of you to be able to, boom, know the Lewis structure for methane. Um, and I would also expect that you guys can look at that and you would know that's a nonpolar molecule. It's perfectly symmetrical. The carbon is a, there's a tetrahedral geometry to that molecule. It's perfectly symmetrical. So it's a nonpolar molecule. So methane, y'all is methane, like in this, in the room you're in right now, methane would exist in what state? solid, liquid, or gas. Methane's a gas in, in the room conditions, okay? Why is it a gas? Because this methane molecule that I drew here and this methane molecule that I've drawn here, there's no attraction between these molecules, okay? They don't want to stick together. Why do they not want to stick together? Well, they're both nonpolar molecules. And the only force that exists between the two of them is a dispersion force. They obviously don't have dipole-dipole forces because there's no dipoles to them, okay? So the only force that exists here is a dispersion force, and that's a very weak force. Now, as we advance through, methane is an example of um, an organic molecule. And you'll recall that anytime you have just a bunch of carbons and hydrogens, um, that's typically a, a nonpolar molecule. Well, as we move up through those nonpolar molecules and say we go from um, methane and let's say we jump to propane. And propane is also a hydrocarbon and its formula is C3H8, okay? I, I wouldn't expect you to know that. Um, but I also would not expect you to know the Lewis structure for propane, so I'm gonna show you that Lewis structure. You have the three carbons in a chain, and you have the hydrogens all around it, okay, like so. Um, now, propane is also a nonpolar molecule. The only forces that exist between propane molecules are dispersion forces. But I would expect that since these molecules look very different, even though they both only have dispersion forces, they do not both have the same degree of dispersion forces. And I mean, that's true, they do not. Um, even though propane is a gas, at room temperature, right? We might have a propane grill at home. Um, if you put it under pressure in, in a tank, you can liquefy the propane. But um, typically, when you're dealing with just dispersion forces, just um, nonpolar molecules, the one that has the higher molar mass, and you, I mean, you wouldn't even have to calculate it. You know this one has a higher molar mass. Uh, means that it has stronger dispersion forces. Okay, so the molar mass is linked to the strength of dispersion forces. And so likewise, um, the higher molar mass, something might 
uh, have a different state at room temperature. So uh, moving along with more about dispersion forces, there's a table in your book, and I'm going to kind of copy it for you here, but the table in your book, it's table 11.2 from your book, and it lists um, the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, okay? And if we were in our lecture room at school, uh, actually sitting in the classroom, that periodic table in our classroom at school is color-coded to show what stuff is a, a solid at room temperature, liquid, or a gas, okay? And the periodic table in our room clearly shows that fluorine and chlorine are gases at room temperature, okay? Bromine is a liquid at room temperature, and iodine is a solid at room temperature, we can explain this based on the discussion we have been having about dispersion forces. Number one, you need to recognize that every one of these is a nonpolar molecule. Because if you drew the Lewis structure for any of these, it's a fluorine bonded to a fluorine, okay? So I'll just put X and X, where the X is either an F or a CL or a BR or an I. And every one of these each side it completes its octet, okay? So every one of these is a nonpolar molecule. So they all have dispersion forces. Also, you could calculate the molar mass of these. And you wouldn't even have to calculate it because if you look at a periodic table, you can tell that I've written them in order of how they show up in group 17. And you guys know that the further you move down that periodic table, the higher the molar mass is. But we could quickly calculate that fluorine is 38 grams per mole, uh, chlorine is 70.9 grams per mole, bromine is 159.8 grams per mole, and iodine is 253.8 grams per mole. So we're steadily increasing the molar mass. So since these are all nonpolar, we now know they only have dispersion forces and they're all similar compounds. They're all just halogens. They're all the same kind of um, homonuclear diatomic molecule. So it makes sense then that the one with the higher molar mass would be a solid at room temperature. And the one with the lighter molar mass would be a gas at room temperature. So in doing that molar mass comparison, again, you have to be, number one, comparing just nonpolar molecules that have only dispersion forces, okay? That's the only time we can just look at molar mass. Also, you need to be comparing molecules like this. See, they're in a similar class. They're all X2. They're all diatomic. Um, over here, when we started, these molecules are in the same class. See, they're just carbons and hydrogens. So they're in the, the same kind of group. You would not want to compare, like, say, this methane. What is its molar mass? 16.04 grams per mole. You wouldn't want to try to, like, compare a methane to a fluorine because they're a totally different class, okay? So we wouldn't make that comparison. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, about why this is. Because when we say a higher molar mass has a stronger dispersion force, we're really not getting into the detail of why. Okay, I mean, it's not really because it's heavier. The dispersion forces are a result of something called an instantaneous dipole. Okay, a dipole, let's kind of break this down. A dipole is like a, a charge separation in a molecule, right, where... Um, a charge separation, you've got a positive side and a negative side, okay? So that's a dipole, um, where there's a positive and a negative. Instantaneous means it happens for a moment, okay? So how would you get a charge separation in a molecule? Well, molecules and atoms, there's electrons that are moving around, right? We've learned about that, how the electrons are orbiting the nucleus. Um, 
and so a lot of times I'll explain this and envision and like when you when you load up your uh, your clothes in your washing machine, right? Um, like if you put that a comforter in your washing machine, right? It's thick and it's heavy. And guys, when you when you put your comforter in your washing machine and you get it started, you know you probably kind of balance that out, right? And as the wash as the cycle starts going and it starts washing. Has it ever come to some point in the cycle where you heard a, a loud noise coming from the laundry room and your uh, washing machine was trying to walk across the floor? Because what has happened? That big old comforter has gotten, even though you put it in there balanced, it got all on one side of the washing machine, right? So it got, it has this, it's not, it's going to be permanent unless you fix it, but that it's on one side of the washing machine. It's like an instantaneous dipole. It's out of balance, and that caused the washing machine to start rocking. Well, see, that was a big old comforter, and so um, that was a, a a huge problem when it got imbalanced. That big old comforter is like a large molecule with a lot of electrons, like iodine, because it's so many electrons moving around, it's a whole lot more opportunity that this iodine molecule can have an instantaneous dipole, and those electrons get out of balance. Well, what happens when the electrons on one iodine molecule become imbalanced, and it has this instantaneous dipole, there's another iodine molecule right by it, and it's like a chain reaction. It starts affecting the ones that are all around. But that instantaneous dipole is more likely to happen on a large molecule. You know, if we go back to that washing machine, and we're thinking, um, that we have something that's delicate that we need to wash. You know, it, um, just a small item of clothing, uh, a small dress. Guys, I hope you're hanging in here with me on my on my analogies. Um, if you put that in your washing machine and it's something small, I mean, it doesn't matter if that small dress gets to one side of the washing machine. It's not heavy enough to throw the washing machine out, out of balance, right? And so that small stuff, it's like the flooring. It's it still has electrons moving around, okay, y'all? And those electrons can still get out of balance, but it's not going to be as big of an impact on the other ones around it. And so that's really what's going on with the molar mass. The higher molar mass has more electrons, okay? And you can have more of a problem with this instantaneous dipole. Um, now, the next intermolecular force we want to talk about is uh, the dipole-dipole attractions or interactions. And dipole-dipole interactions, these exist between polar molecules. So the molecule has to be polar to have dipole-dipole. Now, polar molecules are automatically gonna have London dispersion forces. Okay, because everything has London dispersion. But if it's a polar molecule, it might also have a dipole-dipole attraction. Now, just like we just talked about with dispersion forces, you know, not all dispersion forces are equal. So if I jump back to the previous slide, um, all these halogens have just dispersion forces. But the dispersion forces in iodine are stronger. That's why it's a solid at room temperature than the dispersion forces in fluorine. The same thing goes for a dipole-dipole attraction. And I have another table that I hope we'll insert here. And it is not. Went to the trouble of looking up these tables so that I could pull them in for my lecture. Okay. I don't know why they're not inserting. But, um... Here. This is table 11.1 .1 from the book. Let me see if I'll do this. Okay, if my figures won't insert, I will just do a picture. Okay? So here, I'm looking at this table from the book. Um, and you can see the compounds listed in the first column. And if you look at it, propane, uh, the first one, we've already drawn the Lewis structure for propane, okay? And we've already said it's a nonpolar molecule. 
Well, there's a number, and it's called a dipole moment. And we're not worried about calculating this, but y'all, a dipole moment measures how polar a molecule is. And we know that propane's nonpolar. Okay, it has a very small dipole moment, as you can see listed here, of 0.1. Um, the higher the dipole moment, the more polar the molecule. And so if you look at the others listed, like dimethyl ether, and the formula is given, y'all, if I told you dimethyl ether, I would not expect you to know that formula because these are organic compounds and you haven't had organic chemistry. But if you were given the formula for dimethyl ether, CH3OCH3, I would think that you guys would be able to come up with CH3OCH3 would be able to come up with the Lewis dot structure for dimethyl ether, okay? And when you look at this Lewis dot structure, I would think that you guys can see that around this O, that molecule is bent, okay? So even though you've got those CH3s on either side, because it's bent around that O, there's going to be a little bit of polarity to that molecule, okay? More so than we would see in propane, okay? And as we move down to methyl chloride, methyl chloride would look like so, okay? And I would expect you to know that, oh, that one's got a dipole, that chlorine's very electronegative, right? It's not symmetrical, so that molecule is going to be a little bit polar as well. Now, maybe I can't tell the difference. I don't know if dimethyl ether or methyl chloride. I don't know which one of those would be more polar than the other based on their Lewis structures, but I know they're polar. But if I look here, these numbers tell me which one's more polar. The larger the numbers, a more polar molecule. Okay, and so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as we go on down this group. Now, look at the boiling points. As I go down this table, what is happening to the boiling point? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it staying the same? Clearly, the boiling point is increasing. That's telling me, as I move down that table, it's taking more energy to make to disrupt the intermolecular forces. Why is it taking more energy? Because when a molecule is very polar, it has stronger dipole-dipole interactions than a molecule which is not as polar. So it has weaker dipole-dipole interactions. That means the boiling point is lower because it's easier to disrupt weaker dipole-dipole interactions. Okay? The other van der Waals force that we're going to talk about is hydrogen bonding. And it is the strongest of the van der Waals forces. As I said earlier, even though it says hydrogen bonding, it's not a bond, okay? It's not a chemical break when you break hydrogen bonds. Um, hydrogen bonding is what caused the infant formula to form kidney stones because the melamine that they doped the formula with and the cyanuric acid, which was it was contaminated with, these two compounds hydrogen bonded to one another really strong. And so when the babies ingested them, they wouldn't, it wouldn't break apart in their system and it formed stones in their kidneys. So what's needed for hydrogen bonding? Obviously, it needs a hydrogen, but it can't just be any hydrogen. It requires a hydrogen that is bonded to a highly electronegative atom. And you'll recall that electronegativity is a trend on your periodic table. What's the most electronegative atom? What's going on with the trend there? Okay, electronegativity increases bottom to top and left to right on the periodic table. Fluorine is the most electronegative, right? 
You don't look at the noble gases because they're not going to be bonded to something. So um, hydrogen bonding requires a hydrogen that's bonded to a highly electronegative atom. Specifically, it's got to be bonded to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. Okay? Okay, so it takes that hydrogen that's bonded to one of those atoms and a lone pair of electrons. Okay. Hydrogen bonding occurs in the pure substance, water. You would know that this is the Lewis structure for water. Okay. Does water, we've already talked about, this is our third type of van der Waals force to talk about. Does water have dispersion forces? Yes, it does. All molecules have dispersion forces. So yes, water has dispersion forces. Does water have dipole-dipole interactions? Yes, it does, because water is a polar molecule. You learned that in Chem 1. It's bent. You got those electrons on the oxygen. Oxygen's very electronegative, okay? So yes, it has dispersion. It has dipole-dipole interactions. Can water hydrogen bond to itself? In other words, can this water molecule hydrogen bond to this water molecule? And the answer is yes, because it has to have a hydrogen that's bonded to an N, O, or F. Okay, so it's got that. It has it in multiple places, actually, right? Both hydrogens are capable of hydrogen bonding. And a hydrogen bond is an attraction between this hydrogen and a lone pair on another molecule. Okay, so that represents a hydrogen bond. Do you see that what would happen here is this hydrogen would also be attracted to a lone pair on another water molecule down here. This oxygen would hydrogen bond to another hydrogen on a different water molecule. This one would also, likewise, do you see how that just keeps branching and branching? Okay, so water is capable of hydrogen bonding. Both of its hydrogens are capable of hydrogen bonding, both of its lone pairs, okay? And this is the reason of a lot of the physical properties of water. Of Water actually has a very high boiling point, and we'll talk about that in the, the next video lecture, and things like surface tension. Um, you ever done a belly flop? In the swimming pool, it hurts, yeah, because the water molecules, they like each other a whole lot, and so they're hanging on to each other tightly, and if you mess up your dive and you end up going splat on the water, that's why it hurts so bad, because it's the surface tension of the water is, is so great. Um, you know, you watch the, if you ever watch high diving, um, at the point of entry into the pool there's always a little fountain that's spraying water on the surface of the pool there and I mean that serves two purposes uh, number one you know when a pool is really clear and you're on a high dive which is really tall you lose some depth perception right you you can see the bottom of the pool but you can't really tell when am I going to hit the water um, so it helps with the depth perception but it also helps to disrupt the surface tension of the water you know, so that if something goes wrong in the dive, and I mean, honestly, off of a high dive, the only thing I've ever done is jump. There's no way I'm diving or flipping off of a high dive. Um, but also, if something goes wrong when you are doing those flips, when you hit the water, that little fountain that's spraying on the water, it breaks the surface tension, so it it won't be as painful, because that could be, um, that could be really bad off of a high dive. I mean, you could have some serious injury. Um... So I encourage y'all to read sections 11.1, 11.2. There's an interesting article in your book about um, sickle cell disease. And y'all have probably heard about that in, uh, in biology courses. If you haven't, you'll talk more about it in biochemistry and other courses as well. But it's I think it's a single amino acid substitution, isn't it, that causes sickle cell and uh, certain populations are predisposed to having sickle cell okay it's a genetic it's a genetic thing um 
Now, one more type of intermolecular force I want to talk about. It doesn't really fall under van der Waals, but uh, let's mention it here. Is an ion dipole interaction. Okay? Um, and this is an attraction between an ion, right? A cation or an anion and a polar molecule. This is what happens like when, y'all know salt dissolves in water, right? And you'll recall from Chem 1, you know, salt's an ionic compound. And what do ionic compounds do when they dissolve in water? Remember, they ionize, right? They break apart. So you got like sodium chloride, and when it dissolves in water, it breaks apart as it's sodium ions and chloride ions. It forms an electrolyte. Yeah, and it would conduct electricity um, when it dissolved in solution. And so how does it dissolve in water? Well, since water's polar, right? One side of it is positive and one side of the water molecule is negative. This is how sodium chloride or any ionic compound would dissolve in water. Do you see there's an ion dipole interaction between the cation and the negative side of the water and the anion and the more positive side of the water molecule. Okay, and so there's different strengths in attraction. You'll read in your book, it'll talk about these are coulombic in nature, okay? And the coulomb is just a measure of the force, like how positive is it, how negative is it? And so, you know, if you're talking about like dissolving magnesium chloride, the fact that magnesium has a plus two charge, um, it makes sense that the ion dipole interaction here is a bit stronger than that that is being experienced by the sodium because it only has a plus one charge, okay? Um, I encourage y'all as you're reading, this has been a lecture on section 11.1. .1. Get in your book, look at the sample problems in the book, read through them, I mean, uh, practice them. Do the checkpoints. Actually, when I'm flipping through here, I think there's only one sample problem, 11.1. .1 and one checkpoint, 11.1. .1. But after listening to this lecture, see how you do with those sample problems. And of course, go ahead and start the, uh, the chapter 11 connect as well. Uh, the next video will discuss different properties of liquids, I believe, like the surface tension we've been talking about. And we've talked a little bit about freezing point and boiling point. We'll talk some more about those different properties.